Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll, coming up. The pandemic sets back progress towards gender equality by a generation. We'll look at the latest research and find out how the recovery could be steered to make up for lost time. Mixing business with politics, why a global shortage of semiconductor chips is hurting manufacturers and worrying political leaders. Plus, solving the puzzle of COVID boredom. French jigsaw makers expand after a year that's seen soaring demand for their products. Gender parity is now 36 years further away than before the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Economic Forum's latest gender gap report says it will now take over a century for equality to be achieved. It estimates that closing the disparity in terms of economic opportunities will take the longest. 2020 saw steps backwards when it comes to political empowerment, with women now holding around a quarter of parliamentary and ministerial jobs. But in education and health, the gender gaps narrowed slightly. Let's speak now to Sadia Zahidi, who's the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Sadia, thanks for being with us. Can you explain what has driven this timeline up in the report this year? Why are you saying it's going to take longer to reach gender equality? What we try to do every year is measure the rate of change from the starting point when we started this report in 2006. So um, back in December 2019, when we released the last report, um, that was the, the, the trend analysis at that time meant if you look out into the future, it would take 100 years to reach gender equality. Now, a year and a half later, um, roughly, um, when you take that trend analysis, it means it would take 136 years nearly to reach um, gender parity. And so basically the pace of change has slowed down so much over the course of the last year that we can probably expect that it's at least another generation or two that would have to wait for gender parity. Now, look, this is by no means a hard and fast forecast. This can be changed if we take proactive measures today. Well, let's talk about some of the measures that could be taken then. You've highlighted in the report that in economic terms, women are underrepresented in many emerging industries, things like data and artificial intelligence. How do we address that and how do you do it globally? So first, let me highlight the importance of this. We may think that data and AI is a small segment of roles across the economy. These are some of the fastest growing roles across most countries, but particularly advanced economies, and they are actually no longer limited to just the IT sector. And right now, only 14% of the cloud computing talent, for example, is female. And that is really going to be a problem in the long term, not just because of women's underrepresentation as a matter of fairness, but also these are exactly the sectors that are designing our future economies and societies. So we need to make sure that they are gender equal. Now, how to change that? There are two sides to this. There's the supply side, and that is where a lot more needs to be done to ensure that women are going into science, technology, engineering, and math professions. There also needs to be effort to ensure that a lot of the reskilling and upskilling efforts that are currently going on across various um, companies, but also across countries more broadly, those need to apply a gender lens. The second is the demand side, and that is where companies need to fundamentally change their hiring and promotion practices, particularly for these roles. We found that even where the incoming talent pipeline is relatively big, there's still a very small number of women that are being hired into these roles. So this is not just a pipeline issue, it's also on the companies themselves to change their hiring and promotion practices. I mean, is, does that mean quotas? Does that just, just mean looking at things differently, looking at factors differently? I'm thinking about the legal changes that have been made at company board level about having gender quotas, which have proven effective in a lot of cases. But is that the kind of right approach for this situation? If companies want to come out on the other side of this crisis with the right kind of creativity and innovation and the new products and services that their customers and clients will be looking for, they need to think about having diversity because only through diversity will they get the kind of creativity that can get companies out of the current slump. So they need to think about the business case for hardwiring gender equality today. And what that hardwiring looks like is on the one hand, mapping out very clearly what will be the fast growing roles of the future. 
and then very deliberately ensuring that as hiring picks up again and gains steam, particularly in 2022, making that hiring gender equal. That would be a very natural conclusion to make to ensure that we're tapping into the broadest set of, of talent. A second area is what you mentioned, quotas. Now, some companies may set quotas, but what has worked very well is targets and making those targets something that managers take accountability for and where there is a long enough time frame that they're actually achievable rather than one day to the next. So we know what needs to be done across companies to close the gender gap. What is really required now is the will to do it. So what can, more broadly then, what can governments be doing? You've talked about some of the private sector solutions there. What can governments be doing that'll help to this recovery to bring more equality with it? So one of the biggest reasons that we saw this um, massive impact of the pandemic on women is because sometime over the course of 2020, nearly a billion school children were at home and no longer going to school. And that meant um, a very different kind of care responsibility in the home than there had been for many years previously. And there was a reversal and a sort of a reversal into traditional gender norms and roles inside the home. And women ended up being the ones who bore most of the brunt of the care responsibilities and essentially ended up facing a double shift. So the solution moving forward is again, a similar solution to the past, but even more important today, which is building the right kind of care infrastructure and care services. When you look at the top 10 in this ranking of the most equal countries, I'm struck that there is some geographical spread there. You've got Rwanda and Namibia in there, along with the Nordic countries that we might expect to see. Is there a big difference between how countries in different parts of the world can tackle this? There's a very particular approach that we take with this methodology. What we're trying to understand is whether it is a advanced economy with a lot of resources, whether it is a less advanced economy with less resources, how equally are those resources and opportunities being divided between women and men? So we deliberately disconnect from the level of development of a country. And even then we find a correlation between the gender gap and competitiveness of an economy. So while it's not true that you have to be rich to afford gender equality, it is true that if you go for gender equality, you are likely to be a more competitive economy in the future. Okay, Sadia Zahidi from the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Next to the race to produce more semiconductor microchips as the world faces a major shortage. The technology is used in everything from smartphones to cars. Currently, the vast majority of the global supply comes from Asia and the US government is particularly keen to have more of them made domestically. Kate Moody's here with more on this. Kate, how big is the chip market, first of all, and how bad is this shortage? Stephen, it's a market that's expected to be worth some $450 billion this year. Semiconductor chips are used in virtually everything. Nearly two-thirds of them go into smartphones, tablets and computers. Around 13% are for consumer goods, from refrigerators to smart speakers, and 12% for the car industry. Many in the sector expect this shortage to stretch well into next year, because of supply problems, the likes of Apple and Samsung have delayed new product launches. Car manufacturers have slowed or stopped production as well at an estimated cost of over $60 billion. Who and where are the current big players in this sector and can other countries realistically catch up with them? Well, the big players at the moment are mostly Asian. 43% of the world's chips are manufactured in Taiwan and South Korea. China and Japan account for 15% each. And together, the US and Europe produce only around a fifth of the global supply. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and Samsung are the market leaders, and they're investing huge amounts of money to keep those top spots. Anyone trying to catch up will have to spend billions on new facilities. This isn't just about manufacturing, it's become a political issue as well. Yeah, and that's why we're seeing the likes of the United States and European Union trying to boost their own capacity. A US industry group has called for billions of dollars worth of federal incentives to boost American manufacturing, while the European Union is hoping to double its own capacity by the end of this decade. Chips have also been part of the US-China spat over Huawei, with Washington pressuring Asian suppliers not to sell chips to the Chinese tech firm. Another emerging battleground could be access to raw materials. China has said it will waive import taxes for chip makers who need ingredients like silicon, without which the industry will grind to a halt. OK, Kate Moody, thank you very much for that. Now, during the lockdowns of the past year, many of us have been looking for new ways to amuse ourselves at home. 
Jigsaw puzzle makers are among those that saw a jump in demand. That's encouraged some French manufacturers to expand their operations. Catherine Viette has the story. Thanks to the pandemic, the jigsaw puzzle is making a comeback. And manufacturers have seen sales explode. Demand has gone through the roof. We have almost 10 times more orders than usual. Our capacity is limited because of artisanal knowledge, so we have to train the people we hire. In fact, if we could manage to manufacture more, we could sell more. These puzzles are handcrafted and made out of wood. The pieces are hand cut with a jigsaw, either in the workshop or directly in the store. Everything is done freehand, so there's no margin for error. A piece that is ruined is a puzzle that is ruined. For this manufacturer of traditional cardboard versions, it's the same story. It's really a big surprise. In 2019, we made less than 10,000, but last year we made 70, and this year we're already at 80,000. The pandemic is bringing in new customers. This is one of the first puzzles that we made during the first lockdown. It was for a young woman who decided to set up her puzzle company because she found that puzzles are rather old-fashioned. The models weren't pretty. She decided to do things a little more fun. A million jigsaw puzzles were shipped from this warehouse in Moselle during the year. The company, number two in online sales, is building a new factory to bring all its manufacturing together. COVID increased our sales volume. We are reinvesting the profits in dozens of machines worth two and a half million euros. It will allow us to produce around two and a half million boxes per year. The company also holds a record for the largest puzzle in the world. The 54,000-piece jigsaw costs nearly 500 euros. That's all from us for now. But if you want more global business news, you'll find all of our previous episodes on the France 24 website. And if you'd like to get in touch with your comments or questions, you'll find me and the team on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.